Jack is uh, uh, who is a faithful and wise serv- uh, servant. I was praying, uh, uh, what message to, to share. Uh, there's several I was thinking. One of them was uh, early in the year, I was speaking on a topic to my whole church about uh, gratitude, uh, uh, grace, character, quality. That's so important to have gratitude. But recently, I was at a staff retreat and I shared a, a topic on faithfulness. And I think Seth heard it before. Uh, so Seth got to endure uh, sanitized version. This is a sanitized version. Yeah, because you must truncate it. Huh? Uh, very, very short. So uh, I want to check the time. with the, How much time do I have? Because when time comes, I just cut. You know. Finish or not finish, doesn't matter. Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because uh, my, uh, my hourly rate is 1,000 an hour. <laughs> Once the clock says th- cut, you know. Yeah. No, for churches, I charge 600 an hour. <laughs> Fine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy that we can find, uh, that we can find among friends and uh, joy in the family. And Lord, in this place, there's so much joy that is uh, pure, uh, that is not pretentious. And uh, it's such a joy for me to be part of this joy here. And Lord, as we open your word, as we open our hearts to you, uh, speak to us. And, and we know that uh, even as you nourish us, strengthen us, edify us, uh, your, your joy will uh, multiply in our lives. And we pray, Father, that you give us understanding, clarity. We pray for special enablement for your speaker, uh, the one you're going to use to carry your word. And we commit this time to you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Okay, how much time? Serious. You can preach as long as you like, leave it all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I got you. Matthew 24, 45 to 60, uh, 51. I got to be very fast because it's right at the time. <laughs> Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, give them food in due season? Uh, blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, find uh, so doing. Surely I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servant and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and at the hour that he is not aware of and he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's 20, uh, 45 to 51. Then we uh, move on to another passage. Next chapter of Matthew 25, 14 to 30. Uh, again, uh, it, it here referring to the kingdom of God. Eh? Again, the kingdom of God will be like a man going on a journey who called his servant and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned, settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also come, came. A master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not uh, scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well, you should have put my money in, on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I will receive it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give to the one who has 10 bags for whoever has will be given more and they will have uh, an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. Okay. 
let me give an introduction. The, uh, a frequently asked question. I, I was uh, converted to Christianity in 1963 uh, when I was a 14-year-old boy. So today I'm 75. All right, S a simple maths. And I've been actively serving God since uh, 1965 when I was a, a sec uh, sec secondary one boy. I, I was among the founding members of LSBC in 74. We started the church 50 years ago. And we're this year celebrating our uh, Jubilee uh, anniversary. Uh, now, uh, what people often ask me, uh, uh, Lawrence, what makes you stay on the job for so long? I'm sure you ask your pastor that because he is way ahead of me, right? And my short answer has always been this. I want to remain obedient and faithful to God. Just that. Why you stay so long? Why 50 years, 60 years? I want to remain obedient and faithful. But what is obedience and what is faithfulness? I do what God assigned me to do, whether I like the work or not. That is obedience. Right? Most of us change a bit. I do what God tells me to do on conditions. I like to do it. If I don't like it, no. <laughs> I stay on the job until and unless he reassigns me or recalls me, whether I feel like quitting or staying on. That is faithfulness. Nothing chim, nothing so deep you don't understand. If we just memorize this, you want to be obedient, you do whatever God assigned you to do, whether you like it or not. And then faithfulness, you stay on the job until he recalls, until he reassigns. And it's, it doesn't matter whether you feel like quitting or not. And that is faithfulness. But today, I want to deal with the character quality of just faithfulness. Uh, and I, will, I, that I won't have time to do obedience. And I'm, I'm faithfully serving God. Um, and the point is that I'm not unique. I, I gave a bit of the story. Uh, but that's my story. But I don't, think, I don't think it is unique. I think all of you here... Uh, you have been serving God, and therefore, you are faithful. And we, we are faithful people. Something is a quality that we can mutually uh, affirm one another, we mutually celebrate, all right, that we are uh, faithfully serving God, and you are still serving God. Pastor Derek is an ex amazing example of uh, what a faithful servant of God is. Right? And he has served God for so many years, and he's still serving God uh, despite uh, his age. And I'll tell you that uh, your pastor is my role model. Right? I, I look to him uh, as my role model. I, I got to know him maybe 30 years back, uh, I think during the LIST uh, program when he was a co-teacher, and I was just a student uh, in the list, list program, is leadership in service training with Pastor Tak Yun, and we traveled together. Uh, and I, I always enjoy uh, the, the night, uh, after night meeting, we go out and stroll. I, I walk with Pastor Derek, just two of us talk. And uh, it's amazing that how he can talk to me like uh, he knew me from when I was born, and he would have been old friends, and uh, no no air about him and he was so open and he's I think one person that can can draw you out I, I remember well that was 30 years ago I was much younger then as a young pastor uh, in my heart I say that Lawrence if one day if you have trouble uh, this is the man that you call and speak to All right, that, that is your pastor and he's a role model he should be standing here speaking on faithfulness not me right? however uh, we, we ask ourselves, uh, well, is faithfulness important in life now? Now, right now, is, I mean, is, uh, is it important to you? Or should it be, you know, that you should be technologically savvy, you should be skillful, you should... I mean, faithfulness, is it important now? Second question, is faithfulness important in life in eternity? When we meet God, is, is that quality that is important? Does it matter to God whether we are faithful or not? 
And the short answer is yes. Our faithfulness matters to God. Our faithfulness matters in eternity. So you must take home this. So let me just comment about this faithfulness that matters most. Uh, the parable of the talents recorded in Matthew 25, the second parable that we read, uh, we read two this morning, uh, this afternoon, is the parable I always remember because it reminds me that at the end of my life, when I cross over to eternity, the principal character quality that God looks for in my life would be faithfulness. I think God wants to hold me to account for my life and my uh, character development, my Christ-likeness, etc. But that is a principal quality that he looks for, is faithfulness. And that when the commendation comes, he won't just say you're a good man, but you're a faithful man. And that would be the top. So I think that must be important. God will reward us for our faithfulness. And it is therefore imperative for us to pay special attention to nurturing this character quality in our life. It pays eternal dividends. So uh, let's focus on faithfulness in servanthood. Now we appreciate the quality of faithfulness in a variety of contexts. We can say that the quality of faithfulness normally surfaces in the context of various relationships between the faithful person and the others. So for example, the relationship may be between uh, a faithful person to God. So faithful person and God, a relationship. The faithful person and his spouse. The faithful person uh, and his employer. So in that relationship context, faithfulness crops up. We admire someone saying faithful to his wife, someone who is faithful to his friend, and someone who is faithful uh, to his employer. But of course, for the purpose of today's message, we shall focus on faithfulness in the relationship between master and servant, uh, between the faithful person and God. Or more specifically, between God, his master, and him, right? His servant. Now, I'm clear with the introduction. Are you with me after the introduction? You know where I'm heading? I give you, I'm going to tell you five things. Of course, I can't finish, but we're going to cut at some point, okay? Uh, number one is uh, the point about our availability when we are entrusted by grace. Number two, we are enabled by grace because we are given abilities. Third, we should be engaged in God's realm huh, and begin to see things eternity. See eternity. And fourth, the uh, exemplary trait of faithfulness is to do your work heartily. And finally, the expectation of God, uh, the accountability for it. There's no way you can finish, don't worry. Uh, we'll, we'll, I think probably we'll do three. Huh? Let's start with the first one, no, don't worry. Uh, and trusted by grace and availability. In Matthew 24, 45, who then is a faithful and a wise servant? It's a question, a rhetorical question. Uh, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. First, understand the context of the parable. The context is a household. The parable speaks of a servant. It is not about this household's master and his sons, uh, uh, the master and his spouses, uh, but it is about the master of the house and his servant. And the first thing to know about the servant in the parable is that the servant is in the position where he can make himself available to his master's use. He is found as a servant in the Lord's household. It wasn't the beggar outside the house. It wasn't the delivery cart that comes to the house. It wasn't a friend of the master, but it was a servant in the house. He was in the position to receive an assignment. Where the person is situated matters. Outsiders are out. If you're outsiders, you're out. Make sure you're an insider inside the household of God. Are you an insider or an outsider? Do you know that it's a privilege to be an insider? It's a privilege to be in God's house. It's a privilege to serve the king. Believers are often unappreciative of this 
privilege. And as a result, serving God to them is doing God a favor. This is a startup church, it's a wonderful church. And people come, maybe pastor asks you, oh, why, why you come? Uh? I want to do you a favor, uh, you know? It's a poor thing. Your old man still got to start a church. Uh? Uh, uh, I, uh, I do this church a favor. I won't go to Lawrence Church. So many people don't need a favor already. I will do you a favor. We, we talk like that. You know? uh, of course, your pastor is amazing. You know, when, uh, when, when he left uh, two years with me after enjoying all the benefit. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> And uh, no, I, I just wanted him. You know, he was transiting, and uh, he 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 wanted to leave uh, just big room for Pastor Daniel Wee. I said, "Come, and there's nothing for you to do. Just just enjoy yourself. Uh, spend two years doing transition, no expectation. Uh, but then he he came over and start uh, good gifts, not start. Um, good gifts was already existing. He came to do it, and I keep asking him." Derek, what's wrong with you? What's wrong? You are so old. Huh? You can mess about a small church, Pao Si one, no? Yeah, yeah. And honestly, I couldn't figure it out. Because you asked me today, okay, I'm retiring soon. All right, so in about two years' time, I'm retiring. You say, hey, Pastor Lauren, let's go and start the church. I said, good night. You know, there's no way. There's no way I'm going to start the church because... It's horrors. It's horrors. But this fella, he's a silly fella. He, he, he. Come back to a small church. But it's amazing because the story here that uh, God honors it. And uh, I recognize it. Yeah. Uh, he, he proves me wrong. But it's good to be wrong. Right? And this type of mistake is good to be wrong. So I, I admire that very much all right, for what he's doing, and well, uh, you're not doing God a favor. I think serving God is a privilege. And because if you're doing God a favor, uh, since it's a favor, you can do it when you feel like doing it and drop it when you feel like dropping it. You come and you go. And we ask you why you come, why you go. Yeah. I'm just doing you a favor. <laughs> I, owe, I owe nothing to you. But um, because believers think that they are doing God a favor, the pastor has the additional task of doing a lot of begging in church to serve. Yeah. Pastors say, please, please, please. Mm, let me think about it first. Huh? Please, do can do now. Let me think about it. Because, you know, I'm doing you a favor. But actually, if, if it's a privilege, you ought to be waiting. Pastor, when is my turn? How come you give him a privilege, you don't give me the privilege? You can't mean not. So is your pastor a beggar? When we reflect upon the parable, think of ourselves as servants in God's household. Do we think of ourselves as servants in God's household? Are we in the position of a servant of God? As the context of the parable is the household of God, we ask ourselves whether we are in His household. And we ask ourselves whether we are available to receive God's assignment. If you are not in the household, you will not get an assignment. Uh, many believers are in God's household. Physically, they come to church. But they need God to serve them. You see, when you're in God's household, you take a position of servant, you're in a position to serve God, get an assignment. Many Christians, come, think clearly now. Many people are, believers are in God's household, they expect God, God to serve them. You might not grasp it. Let me tell you a story. Um, many years ago, I employed a domestic helper and he worked for me, she worked for me uh, and she slept very early. I think about 7, 8 p.m. She, she went to bed, all right? And then she wake up the next morning, 11 o'clock. Wow. 
she was often sick. So Cindy and I got a fetched doctor and back, you know. <laughs> and then uh, she wake up, mambo, mambo. I say, sit down, sit down. Say, Cindy gonna mix some uh, over thin. <laughs> we all, I mean. <laughs> and, and finally, she complained to MOM that Cindy and Lauren ill-treated her. <laughs> <laughs> and she left our employment one month later. Yeah. Now, many of us are like that in God's house. We are supposed to be in God's house serving God, but we come and sleep early, early, wake up late, late. So God serve us. <laughs> well, Interesting. God, God go teach, teach us a different thing. We want to be found in God's household uh, in church. This, this is a church. This is a household. It's important that the church is constituted more as a household, less as a corporation or an army. And this is such a family church, a homely church. And people come half an hour before time or earlier. I mean, I came half an hour before time. Uh, Nicholas asked me to come. Uh, Pastor can come at least 45 minutes. I say, in my heart, I say, what? I've never been asked by anyone in one inviting me to come 45 minutes. I want to get you ready. What's so ready? Just hook it up on you, la, you know? <laughs> so anyway, uh, I thought maybe this, is, this, this whole setup is so sophisticated that there'll be so many things to fix. It will take 45 minutes. So I came half an hour early <laughs> to only to discover that a lot of people are already here. No need to get hooked up, man. Huh? All of you all here. And I realized that it is a wonderful household. And although the, the two imagery used here, one is the kingdom of God, the other one is uh, uh, no, the corporation, the household, but I, I, I think that it's very important uh, that we be found in a church that is actively taking care of God's household. If you serve in this church, you will be taking care of people you will be, invariably, because if this is a household, you will be taking care of people. One immediate application of this context of God's household is we adopt the posture of servanthood and not as a visitor. You only visit a house, all right, a family. So you can either be a visitor or a servanthood. Now, of course, I'm not uh, addressing some visitors who are truly visitors. You're going to check the ch uh, church out. I am talking about the long-term visitors, okay? Those who have been in this church for a few years, still visitor. I'm talking to you, okay? But those who just came first time, you are a visitor. God bless you, all right? Stay, all right? In our church, 80% of attendees are involved in discipleship uh, journey cell, doing life together. 70% of attendees are involved in some form of church ministry or other. And they are serving in the church. They serve the church family. We serve one another. Uh, they act like servants in a household, not like visitors in the house. The servant is also available to receive the assignment by grace. I have uh, underscored it, and then uh, the projection, they, they click it, uh, available to receive assignment by grace. The parable merely says that the master makes his servant ruler over his household. He says, I'm leaving, I'll make you uh, a ruler, then he goes. Nothing in the parable that uh, speaks of the, the qualification uh, and uh, uh, whether the person is fit and proper or not. It was a unilateral act on the part of the master. There is nothing said of the merits of the servant, if any. Nothing said about whether the servant is strong, is smart, or soy. All right? <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I don't know how to pronounce the English word. S-U-A-V-E, uh, swaf. But I say swai la, yeah, yeah, swaf. Yeah. S-U-A-F-T. The pronunciation is swaf. Ah. But easier to say swai. Is it because you're strong, you're smart, or swai? No. Uh, the servant may be wondering, why am I chosen? Other servants around him might be asking, why him and not me? You know, have you ever asked God why he chose you to serve him here? The right to choose who to do what belongs to the master. And those chosen for the assignments are recipients of grace. 
they are recipients of grace, the unearned favor. For our part, we make sure that we're in a position of availability to receive the assignment. When God gives you an assignment, it is an act of grace. And grace is unearned favor. When you accept the assignment, you are receiving the favor from God. You are not doing God a favor. No. You are receiving the unearned favor. Okay. Let's look at the other parable. Now, there are parables, 25, Matthew 25, about the one bag of gold, two bags, and five bags. The context of parable in Matthew 25 is business enterprise. Not household, but business enterprise. Uh, the, the master of the servant is depicted as a businessman and not as a head of the household. Uh, so verse 14 says that he's a man who uh, called his servant and trusted his wealth to them, and then he left. Jesus teaches truth in Matthew 25 that are similar to those truths in Matthew 24, but with a slight, uh, slightly different context. The similar part of it is that it speaks of servant. Uh, it does not refer to tradesmen, to tenants, uh, but it presupposes that the servants are available for the master's use. The servants are in a position to make themselves available. They are in or near the Lord's place of business. In the first case, you must be in the household. In the second case, you must be in the Lord's business or at least near the place of business before you could ever be given the one bag, two bags, or the five bags. We know that like the pre par previous parable, the three servants in this parable are also available to receive the master's assignment uh, and all three servants have the opportunity to serve in the master's business. The equal opportunity was not dependent on merits. Again, nothing said on merits. They are not given the opportunity because they are good looking or they are geniuses, but it's a matter of favor and grace on the part of the businessman that have given the assignment to the servant. So this is one thing that you must take note of. Huh? Of course, it adds another truth uh, to the teaching on faithfulness and servanthood. And the additional truth is this second parable uh, uh, in a, is the character quality of ability. That is the second one. And this is the one that I will lead us to the next point. All right? uh, so from uh, the, the first part is just uh, both entrusted by grace, whether in a household or in a business context. But that in the second parable, there's an additional twist to it, and that is um, ability. So we're going to talk about being enabled by grace given abilities. That's point two. The servants in Matthew 25 parable assign tasks, each according to his ability. Abilities do not arise by merit. Remember, abilities do not arise by merit. Abilities are given by God. It is therefore a matter of grace. Whether you are so smart, you go to RI, or not so smart, you go to somewhere else, it's a matter of grace. No one should boast of his abilities, whether a president, scholar, or an ordinary folk. Right? The important truth here is that God will make abilities available to us when he calls us to serve him. Now, Paul was a great servant of God, and he attributed what he was and what he achieved to the grace of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 9 to 11, Paul said, I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. So all the, all the composite thing about his intellect, his experience, his training, uh, and then he said, his grace uh, to me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet yeah, not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And therefore, whether it was I or they, so he preached and so you believed. In another passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul said that he was a builder in God's kingdom according to the grace of God given to him. Again, grace coming. I mean, he's a fantastic guy, but he always said that it's, it's a matter of grace. Now, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise builder, I have laid the foundation and another built it on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. God has given all of us different gifts, enabling us to serve him. It is all a 
a matter of grace. So let's not forget it. Uh, well, if we have time, we should just take time to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 4 to 11, and 27 to 29, all about the differences in the ministry, the diversity of gift, uh, activities, and the, the spirit uh, work in this thing, distributing to each one as they will, meaning it's all a work of grace of God. Now, let us look to God for enablement. Um, let us take care not to cause the grace of God in life to end up in vain. You see, God called you and God will enable you. You first don't be too proud. Next, don't cause the grace of God in your life to end up in vain. Now, in this church, it's, I mean, from the exciting story that Pastor Derek told me about how God is gathering people here and there, uh, many of you are really very blessed in your secular work. Uh, you, you have got all the talents, the abilities, uh, and just remember this, you know, that God is actually calling you because He's, uh, is, His calling is by grace. Number two is enablement is by grace. That's why you're having all those qualities even as you bring them in here. Then the next thing you've got to do is make sure that it's not... Uh, it, Take care not to cause the grace of God in your life to end up in vain. Don't just blow it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, by the grace of God, I'm what I am, and His grace with me was not in vain. So, this is the second thing that I want to share with you about the faithfulness uh, in the context. Okay. Now, the third one, and after this, we'll quit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we are engaged in God's realm, uh, seeing eternity. Who then, Matthew 24, 45 to 47, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household? Uh, you see, Matthew 24, uh, and, and uh, let me see, uh, blessed is the servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him so doing. The master coming back, all right? It's about his master uh, return. And actually, Matthew 24 teaches about the kingdom of God to come. That's when Christ returns to earth with power and glory. And believers are expected to be ready for His coming. Uh, they are the wise and faithful servant in God's household. Uh, so it's about the kingdom, about expecting Him to come and how we live our life. Then look at the second parable, uh, Matthew 25, 14. For the kingdom of God is like a man going on a journey. He called his servant and trusted his wealth to them. Now, Jesus teaches us about the kingdom of God now. Actually, we, there's a kingdom of God to come when Jesus comes back again and his full kingdom come. And, but it's a kingdom of God now today. He taught his disciples in Luke 11.20 that surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Uh, and in Luke 7.21, Jesus said that indeed the kingdom of God is within you. So the concept of kingdom of God is now is difficult for his disciples to, to grasp and of course for us to understand. Uh, and time, again, time and time again, Jesus used parables to explain uh, what is the nature of the kingdom of God to his disciples. The early disciples expected God's rule and reign to be in the earthly realm. Jesus had to educate them. Otherwise, God's rule... Uh, uh, the God's rule over our life, God's rule and realm is uh, also in the heavenly realm, so the earthly realm uh, would, would cease. All right? One day, the heavenly realm uh, will last forever. So he, we, he just needs to teach us the, the, the difference. Now, believers must have the mindset fixed on the heavenly realm where Jesus rule and reign and not on the earthly realm. So Eugene Peterson paraphrased Colossians 1, 3 to 2 in the following way. So it's on the screen. You read it and you, you see it better, right? So if you are serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like you are doing it. Pursue things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along. Eyes to the ground. Absorb the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where action is. See things from His perspective. So how do we see our service to God? How do you see your work in church? How do you see your employment, your profession 
in the secular sphere? Are there things about which Christ precise? Are you absorbed with the things right in front of you so that you cannot look up and see things from his perspective? Now, the two parables that we are studying here set in the context of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I said earlier that Matthew 24 teaches us about the kingdom of God to come. That's when Christ returned with power and glory. Matthew 25 teaches the kingdom of God now. And we must habitually see things from kingdom perspective that you are serving God now, you, uh, your, your serving God now is doing kingdom business, right? So you don't wait until the kingdom come, in the new kingdom, then you serve God. No, 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 you do now, and you are doing kingdom business now, because there is a kingdom now. Uh, there is a pe- prospect of the kingdom to come, that's when you get to be ready, your whole life got to be ready, so these two things come. So uh, you're serving God now, and you're doing his kingdom business, uh, you are serving the king. And you've got to get this perspective right. I've got 12 minutes. Shall I stop here, uh, Derek? Uh, okay. What, last one. I think this is good. Then we stop. I uh, promise you. Uh, exemplary. I think this is good because uh, I want you to be. Do your work heartily. In Matthew 24, uh, the master does not approve the work attitude of the servant that he made ruler over his house while he was away. So it's quite clear. Matthew 25, master praises two servants who worked at their assignment while he was away. Then he condemns the work attitude of the third one who did not work at his assignment. All four servants in the two parables, they were left to themselves, right? Without close supervision of the masters as the masters are away in the context of the parable, right? And uh, in Matthew 24, the evil servant said in his heart, my master is delaying, his coming, so he abused it. Then in the second parable, uh, it's, it's a long absence uh, uh, of, and absence of supervision. After a long time, Matthew 25, after a long time, the master of the servant returned and settled account with them. Now, w- one of the tests of faithfulness, listen, listen, we're going to close very soon now, uh, listen. One of the tests... Our faithfulness is when the boss is not around for a long time. The temptation to slack in the absence of supervision, uh, no, you, you, you will slack, nah? uh, you, and then the actual slacking uh, with the passage of time. And it is fair to say that only faithful servants can resist the temptation to slack. In the absence of supervision, the servant in charge of the master household abuses his delegated authority. He bullies those under him instead of building them up. He hurt the people they were supposed to help. He misuses provision by sheer self-indulgence when he was supposed to uh, use provision to minister to people. And the servant did not work on his assignment uh, the one who didn't work, just simply bury uh, his assignment. Neither the servant in Matthew 24 parable, nor the servant given one bag of gold in Matthew 25, carries out the assignment enthusiastically. I mean, they, they just siam, right? They avoid it. Nah? They're clever fellow, just siam. And the parable described the wicked uh, servant and suggests that the, the other is unwise and uh, unfaithful, right? So the second one is unwise, unfaithful. The, the first one is just wicked. Huh? Uh, and it, we infer that they serve with little heart involved, if at all. They serve with little heart involved, if at all. The remaining two servants in the parable appear they've done their best. They are conscientious in the work, as shown by the results, even though the master did not, uh, was not present on site to supervise them. What can we say of the attitudes and motivation of the four workers in the two parables? Their attitude can be measured against the attitude taught in Colossians chapter 3, 22 to 24. Let me read. Born servants, that's us. We have already identified that. Obey all things your master according to the flesh, not with eye service as man pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord 
you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. The two good servants serve with sincerity of heart to the Lord. In other words, they serve heartily. They serve with all their hearts. The other two servants work with eye service as man pleaser. In other words, they will work while the master, uh, while being watched, where bosses and people can see. They are man pleasers, uh, meaning it is platform service, not behind the scenes service they would uh, perform. Uh. It is behind the scenes unglamorous work, they would shun. And some people are like, like us. What does God look for from one who serves Him? Is it the image of looking good or the inner motivation of the heart? What does God look for from the servants who serve Him? Would He be pleased with the person who works only to show God that He works and slack when God is not around? The trouble with serving God, and all of us in this situation, we serve God in His kingdom business, but we are not aware of His presence all the time. We are not aware of His presence all the time. God's presence in our life is not intrusive. It's meant to be intimate. All right, so when you don't have an intimate relationship, we are just, then you don't feel it. Then because God is not intrusive, you also don't feel it. And because it's not intrusive, you don't feel His presence means that you think His absence. And that is why we all misbehave. We, we are so irresponsible. We don't take God seriously because He's not around. Or at least we feel He's not around. And Therefore, we are in danger that we serve as man pleaser. Assuming, uh, assuming God is different, God is more intrusive. It's always there's a, there's a cloud of God's presence here. There's a cloud here. I mean, cloud flowing. You just can't imagine, right? The, the glory of God follow you everywhere, you know? You dare not to serve, you know? They're not right. But because nothing, what? That's, uh, after, after the song leader finished singing, like, not intrusive. La. I mean, God is present. God is pre- it's not intrusive. We don't feel it. Uh, we see someone lie. La. You know, see someone lie. Anyhow do. La. Yeah. Not, not full of heart. And that is our problem. You, your faithfulness is that even if God's non-intrusive is as if he's not present, I will still do my best. And this is what God is looking for. All right? Uh, so, yeah, with that, I, I, I must... I must close. All right, yeah. Yeah, because other, the light will all go off. <laughs> let, me, let me give jump, 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 and then uh, we come to conclusion. Serving God in, in kingdom business is not easy. It's full of heartaches, disappointments. And it is made all the more difficult when we serve without pay, allow us all volunteers. And we need to encourage one another, to look forward to the eternal reward. And let us remind one another often with the words in Hebrews 9, uh, 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, 9 to 12. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each of you show the same diligence to the full assurance hope until the end that you do not become sluggish but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Let us, also rem- let us also remember the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 57 to 58 that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that your labor it's not in vain uh, in the Lord. So, thank you so much that I can spend this afternoon with you and I'm so glad that uh, this, is, this is such a wonderful church. And I, I pray that um, this quality of faithfulness in your servanthood, in the context of the family and the kingdom business will shine. Let's pray together.